Khan. Uh, welcome to Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities, uh, a webinar series that is uh, co-hosted by uh, Habib University's Department of Comparative Humanities and the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies uh, at the University of Exeter. Uh, I'm Noman Nakvi. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Comparative Humanities here at Habib University. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, usual companion, uh, my colleague uh, at the University of Exeter, the director of in the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, uh, Professor Sajad Rizvi, uh, is unable to be with us uh, this evening. Uh, so uh, unlike our usual pattern, I'll introduce our very distinguished speaker today, who it's really a pleasure, uh, and I'm very grateful to him for taking the time out uh, to talk to us. Um, but first, I'd like to say something about uh, the series. So Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities, in the academic year 2020-2021, uh, as many of you might know, uh, Habib University's program uh, in Comparative Humanities and uh, the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, we launched a fortnightly web series titled Islam After Colonialism. Uh, the series charted the dramatic transformations under the devastating global impact of modern apartheid colonial rule uh, in the nature of Islam in South Asia, where that was a South Asia focused uh, series across culture, religion, politics, society, and the arts. Uh, the decolonial question of uh, alternative pasts and futures was an important part of the series, given that contemporary concepts and imaginations of history, religion, politics, and ethics remain hostage to the modern colonial heritage. This year, our new series, Decolonial Islamic Spiritualities, uh, will remain in the same constellation of concerns, but we'll focus, uh, we'll focus more on the spiritual, ethical, and religious resources that have been marginalized or obscured uh, through the co-optation of religion uh, by colonialism and then its uh, inheritor nationalism. So that's kind of the broad framework. Uh, and uh, my very distinguished uh, guest today, uh, Professor Babak Rahimi, uh, is an associate professor of communication, uh, culture, and religion uh, at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, he has uh, a range of uh, very interesting concerns. Uh, his uh, primary uh, research interests are in Shia Islam, uh, medieval and early modern history, information communication technologies, social media, the public sphere, civil society, and theories of modernity. Uh, so once again, ideal for our uh, program because uh, he works both on the pre-modern as well as the uh, modern period. So that uh, uh, I'm hoping will give us some really exciting insights. Uh, I'm not going to read you his very distinguished uh, uh, series of publications and uh, achievements uh, at uh, any great length, but uh, I'll uh, cite just one uh, book. Uh, it's called Theater State and the Formation of Early Modern uh, Public Sphere in Iran, Studies on Safavid Muharram Rituals, um, 1590 to 1641. Uh, uh, in the common era, and that's published by Brill in 2011. He has many other, many, many other publications. Um, this evening, or uh, for us in Karachi at least uh, this evening, uh, but uh, late afternoon or even morning uh, for some of you, uh, Professor Baba Rahimi will be talking about, this is the title of his talk, Writing Muharram. Imperial Cultures and Cultural Representations of Shia Iran from 1687 to 1879. So without any further ado, uh, Professor Rahimi. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nahvi. Um, I also would like to thank Professor Rezvi for uh, the invitation. And, you know, it's, it's a truly an honor to be able to present uh, my ongoing research and also have a broader discussion on the question of decolonializing Islamic spiritualities. And I think that's, that's a very important key term, Islamic spiritualities. How do we understand it? How do we understand the, the idea or the very practice and the concrete reality of the Islamic spirituality in the world that is assumed to be decolonialized, but yet we still see the remains of the colonial in the everyday in so many different ways. And this is what really this um, presentation is supposed to do on so many levels, I hope. Uh, 
Um, I have tried my best to condense many of the arguments that are brought up in this discussion. And what I do want to do is basically provide a kind of a grand narrative in which hopefully multiple audiences could have different understandings yet have yet a kind of a shared discussion on the question of the decolonialized Islamic spirituality. Now, as the title suggests, writing Muharram, Imperial Cultures and the Cultural Representations of Shia Iran actually changed the date uh, to 1675, I'll explain that later, to 1879, is really supposed to show the connection between discourse, language, but also different forms of representation, including visuality, different systems and techniques of visuality in which other societies, specifically non-Western societies have been represented. And through that representation, a distinct kind of subjectivity is produced to enhance and sustain imperial cultures. Now that is really the, the basic objective uh, of this presentation. Now, before I continue, I would like to show a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm, I'm wondering- um... Please go ahead, you're a okay. co-host. Okay, let me- Share screen, okay. Okay, are you able to see this? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, the first section, and I need to make sure I go, I don't go over my time limit, which is 30 minutes. It's, it's gonna be a section where I'm gonna actually read off from the paper and then I'll, I'll transition to a kind of a free flow verbal conversation. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Babak. Sure. Uh, just so that you feel at ease, you can go well over 30 minutes. You can oh, go I could, okay. My understanding yeah. was 30 you minutes. Can, you can go 45 minutes. Oh, okay. I mean, I'll, I'll do my best. I mean, if you give me more time, I'll go for three hours, but I'll make sure. <laughs> <I'm ready. laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I'll, I put a limit and reasonable limit to my talk. And um, so, uh, I'd like to begin with this. For a large span of the early modern period, now we are talking roughly early 16th to early 18th centuries, um, the critique of imperialism has been among the most urgent arenas of critical historical theory. Beyond the immeasurable economic and political changes it brought, the early modern European imperial exp expansions exerted a powerful effect on how capitalism state powers operated through a reconfiguration of cultural representation, along with territorial conquest, acquisition of material resources, extraction of indigenous and enslaved labor tied to flows of voluntary or forced migration. Now, in recent studies of imperialism, um, researchers and, and especially in the field of post-colonial studies have increasingly concentrated on the complex and at times convergent patterns of practices enmeshed in cultures into which images of Europe became constructed in distinction from non-European ones. The customs, cultures, and specifically religions of conquered or encountered others provided discursive spaces into which new ways of thinking about nature and history could be found through various material cultures. Ranging from books, paintings, cabinets of curiosities, that was a big, big, <laughs> Uh, phenomena back in 17th and especially 18th century, which eventually museums emerged. The British Museum actually originally was a cabinet of curiosity object. And most importantly, learned societies where experiments and discussions flourished. So I'm making a connection here between um, these societies, these societies of knowledge, you know, and also the way in which these objects and these commodities, these scientific commodities are being produced sometimes on a mass, well, not on a mass scale yet, but they're very much um, dispersed and, and used in, in various different localities, especially throughout Western Europe. From Atlantic colonies to Oceania, from Goa to Saint uh, Dominique, today's Haiti, new ways of thinking about encountered other travel and in the process of circulation, where through especially travel writing recorded publish and archive their libraries as knowledge by vying European diplomats, missionaries, settlers, traders, some turned scholar after completing a long distance journey, coming back home to Europe. 
Now, at the core of these new ways of thinking were emerging practices of authoritative representations. These are representations in which the person who's making the representation claims to have some kind of authority. Mostly a person was traveled uh, to, a, to a place, to a country, to a region that gave rise to a kind of a proto-ethnic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, proto-ethnographic texts, especially uh, in the genre of travel writing based on triad relationship of the, of the European observer, the emerging collector scientist, native, and also of course the reader who gave life to the public sphere of reason here recalling Habermas and his uh, famous discussion on the European public sphere in the 18th century at growing consumer spaces such as cafes, salons, and emerging learn societies. Now authoritative representation were also practices that ultimately identified knowledge in detached objective observations in what Mary Lewis Pratt has called the monarch of all eye survey scene, which eventually gave rise to scientific objectivity in the 18th century. One could also talk about how the Cartesian idea of the self, the detached self, the mind detached from the body, so still working in the body is also very much part of this travel writing in which this, the new subjectivity is trying to understand the world but through the so-called detached objectivity. As a source of knowledge, travel writing's tendency to, to elevate the narrator narratorial subject at the expense of the other is apparent in numerous travel literature, a process that coincided with the so-called age of discovery and of course the age of conquest of Americas and the scientific drive to identify categorize, catalog, and more importantly, archive knowledge about the conquered people. To borrow a useful uh, term from Bruno Latour, the French anthropologist, sociologist, early modern European travel writing serves, served as a mobile or transportable forms of information that are returned back from the field to the centers of calculation, that's the term that Latour uses, uh, to which drive scientific knowledge and in a broader sense play a central role in the formation of imperial cultures from the 16th, especially to the 19th centuries. And of course, onwards all the way to the present time, one could argue. Now, such seemingly objective knowledge in both collection and representation of other societies constituted forms of creating categories that constitute the new definitions about culture, history, society, and specifically relevant to our discussion today, religion. As David Chester, um, Mor um, Rosalind Morris, um, Leonard, and Tomako uh, Masozova have argued, and many others have shown, knowledge about religion is produced, circulated, and institutionalized in the emergence of the science of religion in the 18th and 19th centuries, with roots, of course, with roots, of course, in the early modern periods in what could be called new humanism. In these counter histories, religion, along with ritual as a category, um, are not necessarily natural categories, but concept formations that continue to haunt our understanding of the world and human action through imperial cultures implicit in discourses of objective knowledge. Therefore, we are here linking how science, the growth of science, especially in the 19th century when it became institutionalized, were very much tied to the way in which these categories and concepts were being formed by these various so-called scholars and scientists, especially from the 18th century onwards. Now, writing, writing Muharram, imperial cultures and cultures of uh, cultural representations of Shia Islam, Shia Iran, should be seen as an extension of these counter histories through which, uh, uh, with a focus on Shia Iran, the particular Muharram devotional culture, which is essentially communal ritual events are performed that are performed to commemorate the grandson of the prophet, um, Imam Hussein, who died a martyr's death in the battlefield of Karbala in 680, is being represented in a distinct way. Um, now, before I, I continue with the presentation, I'd like to make uh, provide some definitions. Um, I want to be clear that by imperial cultures, I specifically refer to network uh, networks of people, objects, technologies, and knowledge that sustain empires through flexible practices of governmental governmentality. Cultural imperialism operates in various repertoire of performances. The most important, the performance of self-fashioning through which knowledge and power is 
produce and reproduce in situated and complex historical and social ways. Now, um, the case of Robert Shelley is a, is a really interesting one. The ambivalence of an English subject who travels to Safavid Persia, gains knowledge of Persia, comes back to Elizabethan England, and there he is not only representing himself, quote unquote, going native as a Persian subject, but at the same time, that representation denies the fact that he still remain, remains an English subject and a subject of the, the English monarchy. Um, the case of Shah Shelley is fascinating, and I unfortunately I don't have time right now to go in depth with it, but um, I, I see Shelley as a great example of a, a kind of a proto-Orientalist figure who is actually living the life of the Orient he has imagined and lived through actual the travel experience. And, and most importantly, he is one way or another state actor in, in you know, don't take the idea of state too seriously here because the state still in the 18th, 17th century still is in the, in, the, in the making. But nevertheless, we're looking at a great example in which uh, an English character has gone Persian and in return has self-fashioned himself into an authorial figure of what Persia is. And the dressing here, the dressing aspect is very critical to that self-fashioning practice. Now, my aim here is really to draw attention to textual textual, discursive, and visual. So by textual, I also mean both language and visual practices of cultural representations through which Shia Iran have been interpreted by changing network of European travel scholar, officer, um, officer merchants in distinctively essentialist, though at times contested ways since the 17th century. Now, writing Maharam is about textual spaces wherein the exotic becomes Quaritian and the strange becomes familiar primarily because of representational ways of categorizing, indexing, and identifying specific aspects of Iranian life. Here specifically, Muharram, the, the Shia devotional uh, performances in hierarchy of cultures. The idea of hierarchy of cultures, it's going to be central to my argument because both in the two cases, I'm gonna briefly take a look at hierarchies come to play extremely important role. Now, in the first part, I like to focus on Jean Chardin. This is the French Huguenot who traveled to Safavid, Persia. Uh, his first travel was in 16, I believe, 64. And the second one came a bit later, uh, I believe in 1673. Um, I put 1675 because that's really the first time he is describing the Muharram rituals in the broad span of his other commentaries, travel commentaries on Iran, Safavid Iran. And that's why I decided to put 1675. Of course, his book gets published later. Um, and then eventually in early 18th century, the, the book gets translated into numerous books and uh, numerous uh, European languages, but most importantly, the French book, when it was published, it simultaneously gets published in the English uh, um, uh, version of it, and and really Jean Chardin became one of the most important travel writers of Safavid Persia. I explained that in the first section of my talk. Now, the second section, I'm going to move to the 19th century, so we're looking at two different centuries, 17th and then moving to the 19th century. I briefly explained what happened in the 18th century in between. But what's important in the 19th century is that the aspect, the idea of writing Muharram, the idea of discoursing about Muharram as this ceremony, this public event that is taking place in this apparently exotic land, the Safavids, who are supposed to resemble the ancient Persians in many ways, is now, the writing is now undergoing a major change by 19th century. The writing the travel writing, though still there, is now becoming more about collections, now is becoming more about trying to find the origins of a European identity through Persia, specifically Tazia, an aspect, a kind of a dramatic performance of that usually takes place during the Muharram ceremonies, and it was very much popular in 19th century under the Qajars. Two figures here emerge, uh, Sir Louis Pelly, who published his famous uh, collection of Tazia plays, uh, Miracle Play, Hassan and Hussein in 1879. 
and also Matthew Arnold, who's actually a, a person in the background of this text, and I'll explain that later, and the importance of these two Victorian figures in the way in which Maharam was kind of reconstructed into passion plays. I explain all of that in the next few minutes. Now, for audiences who are not aware of uh, the history of Safavids, I won't go in detail, but in 1501, Shah Ismail's captures the city of Tabriz and declares 12 Shia Islam to be the religion of the new state. The Safavids were kind of a you know, millenarian militant movement in which um, they rose to power in Anatolia and central Iran and the Iranian plateau and eventually took over the Iranian plateau. They were really the most important imperial domain that vied with the Ottomans. And of course, the, the idea of Shia Islam being the religion of the state became central to the, the way in which the empire managed to recreate the Iranian plateau into a new cultural and religious landscape. Uh, once be prior to the Safavids, Shia Islam did exist in the Iranian plateau, especially in the northern Iran, Mazandaran region, and of course, central Iran in the city of Qom or the town of Qom at that time. Uh, we also know there were Shia communities in Hamadan and of course, southern parts of Iran as well, today's Iran. But it was not a, really a, a religion that um, was dominant, especially in terms of state power. That changes with the Safavids. There are several institutions in which the Safavids establish. The most important was the institution of the Friday prayers in which uh, was not necessarily accepted legitimate uh, from the perspective of Shia imami religion at that time. The idea was that you have to wait till the Mahdi to come back you know, the, the, the Messiah, the promised Messiah before a Friday prayer will be done. But the Safavids changed that tradition and the Friday prayer became an important event. Um, the rituals of uh, pilgrimage, especially in the later times in the 17th century became uh, important ways in which to kind of advance and spread Shiism across uh, the imperial domains. But also um, there were um, other quote unquote tactics that were used. Most important was Maharam. Uh, Maharam as a, a, a commemorative event of remembering the martyrdom of Imam Hussein was something that already was present, especially in Taimuria period in Iran, of course, Central Asia. Um, but by the Safavids, it really becomes institutionalized, especially in major cities. Uh, the city of Esfahan, the building of the new city of Esfahan in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, uh, really combines urban space with the spread of Maharam and the development of Maharam rituals into major pageantry events, into major military events even. Um, in my, my book, I discuss this in detail, but what I do want to underline here is that the visuality of Maharam did not, the visuality, the urban space of Maharam, the way it was quote unquote stage in especially Naqsh Jahan Square, one of the most important squares in the continent of Asia in terms of urban space, it, it became very much of a visual feast for people who participated and also those outsiders who came to visit and saw Maharam and reported on it. But what's also important is that the Maharam ceremonies never lost its kind of oral performative dimension, the way in which through the sound of mourning, through voice, uh, the, the, the devotion for Imam Hussein will be expressed in public domains. But what the Safavids also were very good at was bringing and allowing these foreign travelers, especially coming from Western Europe, who are already involved in a number of different colonial networks, commercial networks across the globe. Uh, remember by 17th century, we are seeing especially France and England competing, and of course, there's Portugal and Spain still in the background, um, um, maintaining much of the imperial order in, in the so-called new world. Now, uh, these Europeans are part of that larger global network. And now they're, of course, looking at Safavi Persia as a possible strategic domain where they could either benefit commercially or they could actually compete with the Ottomans and militaristically even be able to defeat them. Now, these Europeans are mostly either diplomats or merchants, 
Uh, but some of them are just really interested and curious about travel. Now, when I say they're only cu curious and interested about travel, we should not forget that first and foremost, these travelers are coming from a commercial and background. They're more, one way or another, they have some kind of social and financial capital to enable them to come to Iran, Safavid Iran, and, um, and of course travel, settle, do commerce, but more importantly, more importantly, write travel reports. These travel reports are going to be central to the way in which now the Safavid Persian or Safavid Iranian culture is being uh, uh, depicted, represented to a reading public back in Europe. Remember the print culture is on the rise in 17th century. Books are very expensive, but nevertheless, it's a growing industry. The book itself, I have argued, is a form of a cabinet of curiosity in which knowledge of other people and other societies and other cultures are being recorded and archived into a, a, a kind of uh, exhibit of knowledge and travel reports are no exception. Uh, what's also interesting with the travel reports is that the traveler himself, and usually is a he, is very much participating in that cabinet of curiosity. He's very much center of the cabinet of curiosity of the book. Um, the case of uh, the French traveler Thévenin, who I should have put his picture, he is very interesting, he's also dressed, dressed in a Persian attire, uh, or Safavid attire, is very interesting. He, in his later published travel reports, uh, he has a depiction of Muharram. Uh, now, around this time, in 1665, um, Muharram is very much now pub part of the urban landscape, especially the religious life of Safavid Esfahan. And, you know, the French traveler is now depicting it. Now, what's interesting is that the the writing depiction, the way in which the text of Thévenot, the way he depicts Muharram is different than this picture that we are seeing here. This picture actually was published in the uh, in a later publication in which uh, I believe it came out in Amsterdam, if I remember correctly. Many of these books, by the way, were published in Amsterdam, some in London and some in Paris, but Amsterdam was really at the center uh, because of, you know, somewhat relatively uh, speaking, freedom of of the press, again, I use the word relative here. And what's fascinating about this depiction, it's one of the only two or three we have of Muharram during that time that are depicted in European travel reports, is that the, the ceremonies are condensed. These ceremonies that take place usually around 10 days of the month of Muharram, remembering and commemorating the, the, the grandson of the prophet and his followers who died in Karbala, they're all condensed into this one visual space. And much of the pictures are actually new classical imageries. I mean, look at the, the buildings, as you could see, these are all new classical imageries. Of course, you see the, the hints of the Islamicate culture in the background. And what's interesting is that this does not resemble Isfahan whatsoever. Anyone has traveled to Isfahan, they would not understand this to be Isfahan. But what you could probably understand if you pay attention are these ceremonies that happen taking place. Actually, I pointed out in, in my book at least three or four different processions that are going on or ceremonies. The most important is the front stage. You know, there's actually a theatrical going on here. The front stage, these are the rituals of uh, Begin. These are rituals in which the, um, the devotee or the person who's participating in Maharam it digs himself or someone digs him all the way on the ground, except the head, the head kind of sticks out. And usually the person on the ground stays there for days, fasting and not drinking any water or food in order to show his devotion to Imam Hussein. And of course, some of the travelers make fun of it. They say, you know, at night someone comes and gives them water, you know. What's interesting, though, with this picture is the way in which that is being very much exoticized to a point in which the violence or the self-violence is the first thing you see. And then, of course, in the background, you see all these different kind of processions, which really don't make sense. But it's obvious that you want to show this to a reader who wants to understand all of this in one categorical look, the look of a ritual event in a visual depiction in which could you know, kind of please the eye of that uh, that curious reader back in Europe. Um, take a look, motion is frozen. Take a look, 
we have no access to the mind and to the, to the thoughts of the Safavid subjects here. The agency in many ways is denied. The agency of these Maharam participants are, is denied through the visual practice here. Now, in the case of Jean Chardin, a year later, when he actually visits um, you know, Isfahan and, and he comes to encounter Maharam, I believe for the second time, he, he, we get a different kind of depiction. The depiction is not a visual one. It's a text, it's, it's a discursive one, very typical of European travel reports at that time. And the narrative is fascinating. Um, Chardin is not interested in sensational imagery. He is not interested in depicting Maharam in a way that would actually try to, you know, emphasize the violence aspect of it, the self-violence, which, you know, it, it definitely was a, a, a common practice, but it was not the most important practice of Maharam, one could argue, at that time or even to this day. But what Chardin does is fascinating. Um, I'm going to read parts, not the entire description, which I think is interesting. So here it is, Chardin um, explaining or describing Maharam to his European readers. In um, November 29, 1675, this, um, the, he's, he's depicting this and well, he's, he's encountering Maharam and he, he writes this. During this morning period, in the corners of streets along the uh, crossroads in the square, there were kinds of booths with pulpits and benches around covered in brocade hung from top to bottom with shields, firearms, and arms with blade, kettle drums, side drums, trumpet flags, pennants, lion, and tiger skins, steel suits of armor for men and for horses. One would have thought oneself in the hall of an armory. Besides, mixed with paper and crystal lanterns were quantities of lamps and chandeliers, which were lit at one o'clock at night. The common people of the district assembled and went in procession. At the same time, some Sufi or other somber and devout men start to regal the people with stories of celebrations until the preacher arrives who takes part in the proceedings with a reading from a chapter of the book al qat which contains the life and death of Hussein in 10 chapters for the 10 days of the festivals. He preaches on this subject for two hours, rousing the people to lament. I would never have believed the agony which grips the people. It is inconceivable. They beat their chests, they wail and howl, especially the women tearing themselves and crying in floods of tears. I have been at these ceremonies, this is very important, I have, be, I have been at these ceremonies, I admired the concentration of audience who could have only attended out of intense devotion, although the preacher was extremely moving. This is, and I, one needs to compare this to the writings of, say, Pietro della Valle, you know, and all these different uh, Europeans, Olerius, and all these different uh, European writers and travel writers who depicted Mahara. But one could say this is the most detailed account of Maharam, first and foremost, the way he, Chardin, goes into detail. But what's also important is that Chardin is providing one of the first instances of ethnography of Maharam, where he's trying to get to the minds of the subjects he's studying, but he stops. He cannot understand them. The reason is because he does not talk to them. He does not interview them. He is not your quote unquote modern ethnographer. He stops because he's still very much working with the paradigm of that kind of a, a objective gaze in which he's trying to per, per, somehow represent himself in the process. Representing himself as a kind of a dispassionate observer who's looking at this from a distance and he's looking at all these performances in which do not make sense, but one needs to make sense of. Now, by 18th and 19th century, that making sense of logic becomes you know, paramount with many of these growing or emerging scholars who want to understand Shia Islam and now are actually doing quote unquote interviews and talking to the natives. We get that to the 19th century. I'll get that, uh, we'll, you know, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But what is also important about the narrative of Maharam by Chardin, of course, is the material 
the material and, of course, the colonial aspect of uh, uh, the travel narrative. When I use the word colonial, I'm not talking about Chardin becoming a colonial subject of Safavids, but the fact that Chardin himself was participating in a colonial network of, of exchange of goods, material, and most importantly, human beings. Now, I, I, I get very passionate about this part because it bothers me for all these years, all these years, who are people who have written about Chardin, who have discussed Chardin in great admiration. The guy who talked about Persia as the most civilized civilization of Asia, which is in itself, by the way, very racist. We'll get to that later. Have completely forgotten the simple fact that he was a slave owner, <laughs> that he had a young black boy as his servant. And much of this had to do with the way in which slavery uh, uh, was very much part of, of the 17th century colonial network of exchange of human beings as slaved objects. Now, this depiction is fascinating. You walk into the University of Oxford Science Museum, which um, I have, and it's funny, I never saw this painting myself. Uh, you could come across this painting. Now, what's interesting is that um, there are people that have known about this painting, Chardin sitting, pointing to a map and a black boy sitting in the back or standing in the background holding the map, very interesting. The picture is not that great. But what's interesting is that, again, no one has really, none of the Chardin scholars have really studied this particular painting. What's interesting is that a year or two years ago, an undergraduate student from University of Oxford has come across this. And this is actually a year ago when the George Floyd tragedy was unfolding and, and you know, there were protests around the streets, um, in different streets around the world. Um, the student, um, I'm not exactly sure this happened before or during that time, but it definitely, there is an interesting overlap. Uh, the student decides to do some research and he finds out that Chardin, yes, <laughs> this, this black boy was very much a servant. And, you know, she's, as far as I'm concerned, she's doing research. I've been trying to reach her. I, I still haven't been successful. Uh, but what I understood about this particular painting, of course, is just by looking at the painting, and the painting is not very good, which is actually the original is based in the National Portrait Gallery in London. There are two, three important things that are happening. Of course, first and foremost is in the forefront, you know, Chardin sitting, the great European scholar, former traveler, who was part of the Royal Society and who was also knighted by the king is sitting on his chair. You know, there's the sense of authority. There's a sense of, of course, knowledge that he represents or personifies. And then of course, there's the performance of, of the long hair, which has to do with aristocracy, with nobility. But then he's pointing to one of the most important aspects of Cabinet of Curiosity, which was a very much of a hot commodity in the 17th century, the map. The map itself has a material culture in which participated in the colonial ventures in, by, by mapping, by, uh, by, by locating ge geographies for uh, either potential conquests or potential ways in which to do commerce. And the map, he's pointing to Persia, by the way, a place in which he has traveled, you know, he has written a travel book uh, um, in which the book itself became a huge hit in the European print culture in the 17th and later 18th century. But then there's a boy holding the map. The boy himself is part of that cabinet of curiosity. Of course, behind him is a row of books in the library that's supposed to represent knowledge. I think this painting fascinatingly connects the way in which, or, 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 or emphasize the way in which power and knowledge very much uh, uh, interrelate. And Chardin and the black boy in the background are just really good examples of that. I wanna highlight that because that knowledge in which is very much tied to that complex set of power relations, it, it, it gets kind of reproduced in European imaginary, um, uh, social imaginary later in the 18th century. Of course, um, we famously know that um, Montesquieu based his Persian letters on Chardin's travel reports. Of course, he did look at other travel reports, but Chardin was the main source. Um, this is the time in 18th century when of course, we, this is the age of the Enlightenment, European Enlightenment. But in the case of Safavid Iran, or at least in the case of Iran, the Safavids have 
have disintegrated and we have the rise of Nader Shah and of course later the Zan dynasty. These are the times that Iran, the Iranian landmass is very much uh, kind of a, a, in an insecure situation where you know many European travelers are not traveling to Iran. But what's interesting is that this is precisely the time, 18th century, when many of these Enlightenment Europeans are now writing about Iran. But then imagine Iran, an Iran in which now Avesta being translated into uh, uh, French and later in English is now being seen as a language, a primal language in which originally comes from, which is really the foundation of European identity. William Jones is a great example in which he, he is able to use um, the Vedic and the Persian language as really part and parcel of the basis of the Indo-European language, a term he, he coins as well. And the fascination in the 18th century is really to find, philologically speaking, to find the origins of the European self. Of course, while that's happening, the European self-fashioning happening through the Persian subject, looking at Persia as a place of ruin, at the same time place of exotic, there's something else is going on, the formation of the category of religion in its modern sense. Um, it's interesting that Bernard Pickard's famous ceremonies and customs of religions around the people of the, around the world was really first and foremost the, based on the travel reports, including especially Chardin's travel report, but also it was really a foundation of the study of religion, one of the foundations, theoretical foundations of the, the study of religion. What's important about this book, of course, is not just certain religions and rituals of these religions were, were this studied uh, in this book. In, in, what's interesting is that they were not really extensively studied. What we see here is are the set of engravings, a regime of visuals in which religions are juxtaposed, put together, categorized, and made into indexical categories for that European reader who is buying, who is really buying this very expensive book. So we are talking about a literate community, but a literal community who is very, very influential and is looking at this book in a very significant way. And what's interesting about this particular text is the way Maharam reappears. Maharam reappears now in the way in which is juxtaposed with an Ottoman, as the, the term here is the carnival of the Turks, with the Ottoman ceremony uh, into one page. So the, 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 the visual display is fascinating. The bottom part is Maharam, uh, supposed to depict Safavid Esfahan, at least that's my understanding. And then the, the top part is an Ottoman carnival festival. The, the combination of putting festival, and by the way, bottom, it is, this is the first time where uh, the Maharam is not described as a ceremony, it's described as a fete or kind of a festival. Very interesting. And what we see here is a kind of a visual overlapping of two events that do not necessarily share a, a, a kind of a worldview. You know, they do not share a religious content most definitely, but nevertheless they are somehow overlapped or put next to each other as a way of kind of showing what the so-called Mohammedan ceremonies or religions or culture is supposed to be about. This is really one of the only first times we begin to see culture and religion kind of uh, overlapping. And this becomes a very common theme, by the way, especially later on in 20th century, when you get someone like Clifford Gertz basically seeing religion is just a cultural system. Much of this goes back to the way in which religion is being visualized in these books that are now increasingly categorizing uh, religion. I should also make a note, uh, Chardin's travel report for the first time, for the first time, unlike different travel reports that comes before him, is actually putting religion into one chapter category. <laughs> That aspect is fascinating, which has really escaped the attention of many scholars. And the reason is, I think, is because now, unlike the previous travelers, which came from a humanist background mostly, Chardin is really epitomizing a, a kind of an encyclopedic understanding of society in which religion becomes a section of its own. Uh, by 18th century, this when we're seeing this depiction here, religion and culture are kind of either put together or sometimes they do overlap. And I think that's something very interesting to make a note of. Now, 
we could go on in depth about the Chardin travel reports and of course his, you know, the impact it had on in the European imagination and of course the imaginary of the, the, the social imaginary of your early modern Europeans about themselves and of course about the others. But now I wanna move to another century, the 19th century. I'm gonna make sure that I, I finish this in 10 minutes. Um, I've already gone more than I expected. So by 18th century, late 18th century, a, a new dynasty takes over the Iranian landmass. This is, these are the Qajars who actually originally were part of the Ghazalbash, uh, one of the tribal confederacies that participated in the Safavid movement in the 16th century to take over Iran. But the Qajars are, are um, really interesting dynasty because uh, of course Shia Islam is, continues to be the state religion, but now uh, the Qajars are um, kind of urbanizing in a very slow pace. They're urbanizing Iran, uh, especially by towards the middle of 19th century. Um, they're trying to modernize the army. Of course, they're encountering these European empires. And of course, this is the time that we need to acknowledge the rise of the European imperialism, especially by late uh, 19th century when we get new imperialism, the conquest of new lands and the conquest of Africa, the entire continent of Africa as well. This is a major development. So the Qajars are dealing with that kind of a European kind of imperial advent adventurism. And so they are trying to quote unquote modernize and reform on education, on uh, urbanization, a very low pace, very low process. Uh, but nevertheless, something is happening because what we get is that let me go back to this. By late 18th century, um, they are also trying to quote unquote modernize Muharram rituals. How is this happening? By late 18th century, we get actually middle of 18th century, we get the first instances of Tazia performances in the island of Khark. A, a Danish German uh, scientist, very important to note, a science, scientist who was on a science expedition lands in the island of Khark it was dominated or controlled by the Dutch and he encounters what we understand to be the first Tazia performances. What are Tazia performances? These are Muharram ceremonies that orally come to perform and depict the tragedy of Imam Hussein. So there is actually an orator who comes to dialogue with another who is supposed to represent the army of Yazid who has come to, you know, you know, kill off the, the followers of Imam Hussein. And the battle scenes are fascinating. To this day, if you go to, especially Southern Iraq, you're able to see those battle fights, the kind of mock battles in which they take place. People, uh, the participants, the audience were actually participants as well. They're not your theater audiences where, you, you know, they, they wail, they mourn, they cry. By late 18th century, these dialogues become more formalized. They become more poetic and they become more, they become longer. By early 19th century, various different cities in the Qajar, under Qajar domain, especially Shiraz, but more, most importantly, Isfahan and Tehran are um, uh, seeing the proliferation of Takia. Takia, of course, are the places where Tazia takes place. Now, Takias could take place anywhere. Takia could pl take place in the middle of street, in a corner, in a square, in a village center, the center of a village. It could also take place at the house of someone. And usually that's how apparently Takias grow. Takias grew uh, as a result of them being performed in, in private domains of wealthy Iranians who wanted to you know, have these performances as a way of achieving blessing. And of, of course, at the same time, doing different kinds of ceremonies. And of course, at the same time, you know, pumping up their own social status in their urban communities. Uh, by middle of 19th century, uh, Tazi becomes literalized. That is to say, becomes a kind of, accompanies a bit of a literature, even though it, it's not a literate performance. It's supposed to be oral performance. But by 19th century, we get the, the famous Amir Kabir was trying to put this into a kind of a, kind of trying to literize it. Uh, and the European travelers are also encountering these ceremonies and they're fascinated by it. Um, um, a, a Polish and a German traveler really provides the first instance of Tazia being collected, the Tazia performances, the oral performances, the so-called Nosre, the, the text that the one of the performers comes to read even though they're not really reading it, they're just using it as a tactic to make sure that the audience doesn't think that 
they are associating with one of the holy figures in, in the ceremonies uh, by performing the rituals, that these noschas are not being put together and they're being collected and put into a book and sold, being sold in the European book markets. That's happening sometime around the middle of 19th century. But then something fascinating ha happens. Nasser al-Din Shah, the famous Qajar king who lived a long life, eventually got assassinated, travels to Europe, travels to France and uh, England, especially um, visiting one of a number of different theater venues, the, uh, the Victoria Ro Royal Albert Hall, Hall and also the, the, the Paris Opera House. He gets inspired. He's like, you know, we should have <laughs> a kind of an opera house, I guess you could say, for Tazia in Iran. And this happened. And this happened, of course, it took a while. We still do not know exactly when it was established, 1867, 1869, there's a whole debate about it. But we do know is that Takia Dolat, the Takia of the government, became the most important case in which Tazia now became um, a somewhat of a full-on, somewhat of a theatrical, uh, stage events where there is the stage in the middle and everyone goes around it and they mourn and of course the Shah is is also participating he's sitting somewhere in the back um, and 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 this is also the first instance where you know one could say that Tazia is becoming quote unquote modernized uh, now I want to be very careful here you know they're they're imitating some of these architectural sites back in Europe but this is very much of an indigenous uh, uh, process, though, and, and I believe in Italian, I forget, a European architect was also involved in consultation with this. Now, what I was trying to show here is that the Muharram is undergoing change. It's undergoing change mostly because of, of the way in which a number of Europeans are not just writing about Tazia and collecting, but there are also many ways in which the Shah of Iran is actually getting inspired and borrowing some ideas and by that, he's actually changing the form of Muharram, especially in this Tazia manifestation. Now, while this is happening in Qajar, Iran, which is a very interesting development on its own, another side development is happening in Europe. Many of these Europeans, and when I say many, I'm actually talking about four or five uh, leading figures who are being read by thousands of people, by the way, in the European reading public, they're now looking at Tazia as a way of discovering themselves. It's like, what, what are you talking about? This, Tazia, what does that have to do with European culture? Well, I explain it. It's a fascinating story. It has to do with, actually, let me go back to this gentleman here, Musio Gobine, who was fascinated, who was fascinated uh, by Persia. He traveled as a diplomat to uh, Qajar, Iran. And while there, um, he wrote his impressions of Tazia. How did he do that? Well, he wrote it in this famous book called The Religions and Philosophies of Central Asia, where he's actually talking about Iran. He's talking about Babism in the first section. Then the second section is talking about Tazia. He actually has seen Tazia. He wants to write about it. Uh, but also, we cannot escape the fact that Gobine, who is a diplomat, a state official, wrote a famous or infamous book called Essays on the inequalities of human races. In this fa fascinating and disturbing work, we get really the first instances of biological racism, where the twin concept of Arianism and Semitism is clearly described. And much of this is also um, profoundly well discoursed during this time by a number of other people. Um, the idea of Arianism actually goes back somewhat to the 18th century, and unfortunately, I don't want to talk too much about this, but it was supposed to be a linguistic phenomenon that the Indo-Europeans were really, uh, uh, Indo-European languages were really a phenomenon in which uh, were developed by the Aryan people. The race wasn't really that much used in the 18th century. The race aspect comes in the 19th century, where now Aryanism becomes a full-on racial category and the idea was to distinguish from Semitism, or more importantly, the Semitic and, and the Jewish culture. And by doing that, the idea was to show how Christianity either is another formation, is another form of Arianism in disguise under Judaism, or is actually a Jewish 
kind of a phenomenon that should be discarded. That's a famous argument by Nietzsche, by the way, who, who very much you know, uh, also articulated that view. With Gobineth, though, we are, we are seeing something else. And I've got, of course, all these different thinkers have their own distinct arguments. But Gobine is interested to find the origins of European idea, or at least he thinks that there is an original speck of European identity in the Persian, even though the Persia of today in the Qajar time is really not the original Persia. But he wants to, he's fascinated by it. He, he, he eagerly wants to travel to Iran. He accepts the diplomatic position. He goes there and he writes this fascinating book. And I say fascinating because this is where we get the first instance where Tazieh is being racialized. <laughs> this is the first time that Tazieh is actually being defined first and foremost as a passion play as even superior to the Greek plays. But more importantly, is the expression of Persian patriotism against Arabs. Where did he get this from? Well, he didn't get it by interviewing the, the, the Qajar Iranians who participate in the rituals. I mean, there's no depiction or there's no account of interviews and having discussions. Not to say that that in itself would have been enough, but I'm saying that what Gobine was trying to do is really projecting his own racist views on the so-called Qajar Persians, seeing them as first and foremost superior to Arabs and seeing Tazir as a cultural expression in which very much resembles the Greek culture but also the Christian European passion plays in which share, just like the Indo-European language, they share a kind of a cultural essentialist identity. You might wonder, you know, what kind of argument is this? You might wonder, is this even a valid argument? Um, well, it was certainly valid to Matthew Arnold, the famous Victorian essayist. And essayism, by the way, is another major thing in the 19th century, who um, in Birmingham in 1871 gave a lecture based on Gobina's writings on Tazier. So, you know, Matthew Arnold, the, the famous person who wrote and invented the category of culture, some have argued, the person who actually wrote about various different Celtic, you know, and, and different cultures, including the Celtic, um, is now writing about Tazier. He feels that he has an authority based on Gobine's visit to Iran to write about Tazir. And he actually recycles in a fascinating way Gobine's uh, uh, conception of Tazir in a racial, racialized sense. Now, let me uh, read this one short passage. So this is Matthew Arnold talking about Count Gobine. And he's, he's praising him. He's saying, oh, look, you know, he has something very interesting to say about Tazia. Let's, let's know what that is. And he says, Comte Gobine, formerly, formerly Minister of France at Tehran and Athens, published a few years ago an interesting book on the present state of religion and philosophy in Central Asia. He's favorably known also by studies in ethnology. I should also make a note here that this is also a time when folklorism and study of myth is on the rise, especially in Germany, originating in Germany, but Brits, and I'm including here Scots and you know some Irish writers, and of course, um, the French and the Scandinavians are fascinated by folklorism and trying to discover this pre-Christian identity in which someone is lurking in the present through Christianity. Now he continues to say, he's favorably, Comte Gomine, uh, He's favorably known also by studies in ethnology. Okay. His accomplishment, accomplishments in intelligence deserve all respect. And in his book on religion and philosophy in Central Asia, he has the great advantage of writing about things which has followed with his own observation inquiry in the countries where they happened. Um, uh, you know what, this is too long. I'm not gonna uh, read this part, but here's the part I wanted to read. Kant Gobine suggests that it is to be found in the feeling of patriotism. So he's really reciting Kant Gobine. And that our Indo-European kinsmen, the Persians, conquered by the Semitic Arabians, find in the suffering of Hussein a portrait of their own martyrdom. So really the martyrdom of Hussein is really the reflection of Persians getting uh, suffering under the, the evil Arabs, the violent Arabs, the unsophisticated Semitic Arabs. He, his father Ali, the whole body of Imams taken together represent the nation, represent Persia, invaded, ill-treated, despoiled, stripped, 
of its inhabitants by the Arabians. The right which is insulted and violent in Hussein is identified with the right of Persia. Where did he get this? Gobineh. The Arabians, the Turks, the Afghans, the inferior races. Persia's impeccable and hereditary enemies recognize Yazid as legitimate caliph. That's not true at all. Persia finds there an excuse for hating them the more and identifies herself the more with the usurper's victims. It is patriotism, therefore, which has taken the form here of the drama to express itself. He's actually quoting Gobineh, and he's saying that's really the right way to, to understand Tazia as a very distinct ritual, which could tell us something about our European identity. And how we could do that is because something is shared with the passion plays, which is are still being performed in Europe. What's interesting is that Matthew Arnold is ignoring that passions um, pa plays were actually kind of died away from 17th century, 16th century onwards after the Protestant Reformation, they did revive, they were revived in the late 19th century, mostly out of nostalgia. The kind of similar nostalgia, the longing for myth and pagan cultures and rituals in which people like Arnold are also celebrating in the 19th century. Now, 1879, the most important development in the study of Maharam uh, uh, takes place. The publication of the miracle play, uh, miracle play Hassan and Hussein by Louis Pelly. Who is Louis Pelly? He is a British colonial officer stationed in Boucher of Iran. I actually have visited that place where the British used to be stationed. It's now ruined, but back then it was the most important strategic location for the British military, mostly because it's based in Persian Gulf, but more importantly, it actually has connections and he allows communication, uh, um, um, kind, of a, kind of, it's kind of a communication paradigm for the British uh, after the Indian mutiny, which took place. And it was uh, the Boucher uh, military base was extremely important, mostly for telegraphic purposes, mostly for, for uh, communication purposes. And, and Pelly is there. And I wanna really underline this important fact, just like Chardin, of course, two different characters. We are looking at a state actor someone who's very much involved in networks of communication, knowledge tied to imperial and colonial and commercial expansions of Europe. This book is being published, why? Because he spent all those years in Boucher, also he spent some time in India um, as an officer, and he's now, he has collected 33 of the Tazia performances, what's called cycle uh, episodes with different aspects of Maharam are depicted throughout, especially the 10 days of, Ma the first 10 days of Maharam. And he's now, he has collected them, he has, and he has done that, and this is very interesting, uh, an important point to make, is that because he had a native collaborator, an Iranian who helped him actually uh, um, write down the, 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 the performance or the, the oral you know, text, and then put it into a textual form, and then eventually, um, have it published in England. He also got help with two other Orientalists, one of the Orientalists, another person who actually translated. I'm not sure if actually he was a translator, I forget, but, but nevertheless, this was a collaborative work. That's the point I'm trying to make. And this was another great example of, of a fascinating, of a fascinating kind of a folklorism in which is being put together in a collection as now as being uh, sold in the European book market. What's important about this particular publication is the preface. The preface, uh, Lewis actually is making reference to Matthew Arnold, <laughs> who of course based his ideas on Gobineh. And he's saying, look, Tazia is actually a reflection of the Persian revolt against Arabs. It's really a nationalistic kind of expression in which fundamentally is based on this divide between the Aryan and the Semites. That twin paradigm becomes absolutely central, of course, not with these 19th century thinkers, but in fact, later on in the modern scholarship of Maharam. And this is where I'm gonna get in trouble. I don't really care because this is where we need to do our battle. We need to actually challenge the kind of colonial categories in which continue to hunt in today's scholarship. As you could see, I'm pretty passionate, but you cannot say that I'm playing in a passionate kind of a passion play because I would argue passion plays of medieval Christianity are very different from Mahara. 
And unfortunately, repeatedly, we get in encyclopedia entries in today's uh, modern conception of Tazi, especially, we get constantly this idea of passion plays as similar to Tazie, and even at times in this particular book by Professor Janet Afari, even a borrowed terror tradition from uh, Europe. This actually argument was proposed sometime in the middle of 20th century. Later on, Ali Shariati very much popularized it, believe it or not. Ali Shariati popularized the idea that Tazie is a European invention because the Safavids went to Europe, borrowed it in order to come and dominate Iranians in order to create an uh, opium for the masses. This whole idea of, of Safavichism. Then this idea kind of gets recycled without critical thinking in this particular book in a chapter on Maharam where Professor Jafar is actually comparing, not only comparing, but she's basically saying there are really the same, uh, uh, the, the, the passion plays which were used by right wing pol uh, politics in Europe and conservative Christians. It very much carried the same logic as Maharam uh, performances. And Foucault, of course, just uncritically understood these rituals and he kind of recycled them. That's why he was seduced. I don't want to get into the Orientalist tropes of being seduced by Islamism. I don't want to get into the, the Orientalist imaginary in this particular book. I've already criticized this book. And to this day, I continue to be baffled by the way in which this, this, um, this particular chapter of Maharam has been presented. Uh, I could talk about this for hours, but what does bother me though, is this uncritical reception of some of these colonial categories in the way in which they are not only appear in academia, but also in popular culture. Consider for instance, Tazia being performed for the second or third time outside of Iran in New York Lincoln Center. I could see to the picture to the right. This is another example, which symposiums took place in New York University. People talked about, of course, them being similar to passion plays. <laughs> People talked about how these ceremonies showed an authentic performance of Tazie, of course, ignoring the fact that this was done mostly for a Western audience. And it was done in a way in which it was staged as a theatrical rather than a lived ritual event. But more importantly, this emphasis on passion plays and, and, and connections with Christianity it's something that I argue very much goes back to 19th century idea of understanding Tazia as, as really having kind of a cultural identity root of a Persian spirit. Um, I could actually go on for another hour. I'm gonna stop. What I wanna um, conclude here, um, I wanna say, I wanna propose this finally. How can we represent Mahara? Uh, first and foremost, I would argue that we have to do some really self-reflective ethnography. Not the kind of ethnography of sitting and just simply interviewing a bunch of people and writing them down and collecting them. If you're interested to do decolonializing knowledge of Islamic spirituality of this Muharram kind, which is massive because it's not just about Iran. You have to look at you know, subcontinent, you have to go look at Trinidad, you have to look at so many places. You have to look at Muharram in diaspora. You have to look at Muharram in London, for instance. Then you have to really understand some of the basic themes that are, I want to use the word foundation, but are very much the, the, the frameworks in which Muharram are performed. First and foremost is devotional love for Ahlul Bayt, Imam Hussein specifically. How do you understand devotional love? How do you come to narrate it? How do you come to represent it? Um, I'm only going to ask that question. I have my own answers. I'm not going to give it. But I give you one possible solution. I remember I mentioned self-reflexive ethnography. Consider Kiarostami's fascinating reperformance of Tazia in Paris and in, in Padua. I, I think it was Rome too, sorry, in Rome. It, it created a lot of controversy. Uh, Professor Hamid Dabashi slammed it as a tourist circus attraction. It's funny, he did not crit criticize Gaffari's Tazia performance in New York, not that far from Columbia University Press, okay? Not that far. But he was very keen on criticizing Kiarostami's uh, um, Tazia. But what he ignored about Kiarostami's Tazia is the self-reflective way in which Kiarostami is trying to point to the fact that Tazia is not theater, that Tazia actually is not a stage performance. And how did he do it? he actually, instead of focusing on the stage, <laughs> which Tazi actually does not have one, even in the Takiya Dolat, the, the stage is not supposed to be the stage that we are doing understanding theater, 
modern theater, or Western theater, but he actually focused on the audiences, the so-called audiences. He put four or five, I forget how many video installation of different people, women, men, who are actually looking at Tazie. And by doing that, he shifts the Western audience attention, not to the performance itself, which is very important, but to the performance of the audience mourning, because mourning is absolutely central to Muharram. And that was the kind of self-reflective ethnography, which in my opinion is something we could learn from. Kiarostami was not an ethnographer, but he used the idea of self-reflection or self-reflectivity, which is central to his cinematic work, which he also used, um, which, in which he used Tazir as a model in his cinematic works. He actually said that in order for us to better understand how one way or another, we need to be constantly in the struggle of deconstructing our categories, our perceptions of the world. Yes, our first and foremost task should be deconstruction. I sound very Derridian, but why not? Why not? And deconstruction is not that far from critical thinking. That's what it really is. Critical thinking of everything that is in existence, including our very concepts that we use. And first and foremost, we need to do a genealogy. We need to go back. We need to take things apart. And by doing that, coming back and reconstructing in a way that could give us a new awareness of not only who we are, not only how we have been shaped, but more importantly, the kind of selves we could be in the futures to come. Thank you very much. Uh, one doesn't usually do this, but I really want to clap. That was really, really just thrilling. Uh, there's uh, so much in there to talk about and so very suggestive and very, very thoughtful, uh, also very, very pedagogical. So I'm also, as a, a teacher over here uh, for my students, uh, I'm also very grateful uh, for this, uh, you know, pedagogically rigorous, conceptually rigorous, uh, and for the bibliography as well, I'm thankful. Uh, there's uh, so much to think about and learn. Uh, I, I'll be going over this again myself. I'm going to uh, re-watch uh, this session. So, thank you very much, by the way. Just thank you. It was very kind. So, uh, the, some of the, you know, this is very, very helpful uh, to me because, of course, uh, one of the major ways uh, in which uh, Shias, yeah, uh, in where they are in a minority in a place like Pakistan, for instance. But uh, you know, it's not the only place. And lots of places where she is a, a minority, they have to suffer this uh, objectification, especially of the Muharram festivals. Yeah, this is something that you'll find, especially the more rational, you know, the modern rational uh, side of Islam. Yeah, a lot of Wahhabi. Uh, I mean, I don't. I, I mean, I don't approve of this use of the word rational because I think it's actually a bizarre form of rationality that is uh, emerged in modern times, as you are indicating. Um, but uh, what, what should one say? Rationalistic. So this representation, yeah. So a fetishization of reason itself, and a, which means the distortion of reason uh, itself. Uh, uh, this representation of Mohara as this, and it's very interesting, the objectification of uh, the uh, ceremony, yeah, the objectification of Tazih, uh, of uh, Tatbir in particular, yeah, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, Tatbir, uh, self-flagellation that is, uh, for those who might not be familiar with the term, uh, the objectification of it is essential to, uh, the, you know, uh, the revulsion, it's interesting, yeah? The revulsion against, the revol uh, being revolted by Shiaism, yeah? Uh, because, you know, lots of modern people, including Muslims, and even Shias feel embarrassed, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. More modern Shias, yeah? They feel quite embarrassed by uh, these uh, morning rituals, yeah? Uh, and actually, it's not, I mean, Tatbir is the limit. Tatbir mm -hmm. is the extreme... Uh, limit, yeah, of that revulsion, but mourning in general, you know, because uh, for to the modern mind, it's like, okay, 1400 years, this is typical, yeah, mm -hmm. 1400 years have passed, what's going on, when are you going to get over it, and the whole uh, premise of modernity, you know, as they say in, in American English in particular, you know, Americans uh, have a way of 
uh, putting these things uh, quite uh, simply. Yeah, uh, get over it. Yeah. So right. <laughs> so, so this. Uh, so so it's very very helpful to know that this is in fact a modern and a colonial uh, white supremacist uh, way of looking at uh, uh, at Mahara uh, and at uh, the Tazie, at Tatbir, at uh, mourning, at, at the morning and devotion, morning and devotion uh, for uh, Imam Hussein. Yeah, uh, actually, you know, uh, I'm sure you're, uh, you're familiar with it, but I came across uh, uh, my first exposure to uh, this kind of uh, representation of Muharram was actually, you know, uh, Elias Canetti, his book, Crowds and Power. He has a, uh, you know, long section on Shiaism and on Muharram in yes, particular. Yes, you're right. Yeah. It's in uh, the, religion, uh, the religions of lament. So first comes Catholicism. Uh, and I just happened to have it on my uh, laptop. So he says, uh, religions of lament. So Catholicism and uh, Shiaism, which he's going to talk about, religions of lament will continue to be indispensable to the psychic economy of men for as long as they remain unable to renounce pack killing. Pack <laughs> killing. Yeah? And there are these really, really crazy descriptions of, uh, of Muharram in particular and of Tatbir, uh, uh, Tat Tatbir especially, of course, you can imagine, and of the entire crowd. I mean, very much in the kind of uh, tradition of Gobineau, yeah? yeah. Who, of course, he does mention in this book as well. He says the frenzy which seizes the morning crowds during this festival is almost inconceivable. Yeah, uh, th this is the kind of thing they, uh, you know, just like you're saying. So, and of course, this is just a 20th century. The guy won a Nobel Prize. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it goes on and on like this. Uh, it's just really remarkable the revulsion that he tries to evoke. Uh, uh, against these, uh, both the religions of lament, and of course, Catholicism is also, I mean, in its own way, has been minoritized in the modern period. And, and, you know, modernity is largely Protestant. So the Catholics are also, you know... As the so, other, they're seen as the other, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and you know, pre-modern or non-modern or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yes, this is really, really helpful. And of course, it's, it's extraordinarily... Uh, extraordinarily harmful to the, you know, uh, to just as you were saying towards the end in terms of both the self-understanding of Shias, but also Sunni and Shia relations, uh, for instance. Uh, it, you know, I mean, people used to participate. It was not thought of as just this revolting kind of- That's right, that's right. Yeah, uh, bizarre kind of thing that, uh, you know, Shias do, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, so th that's really, really helpful. Um, I should, of, can I make a note of, of the violence aspect of it? It's fascinating. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned, of course, that Tatipir is, 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 of course, it depends which locality you're going to see that kind of performance in which usually in the, the, the male-specific, but also you find it in female-specific rituals in which self-mortification is happening, either through you know, a chain or a knife or something. Uh, it it's fascinates me that, you know, these are ceremonies that happen as part and parcel a broader spectrum of Maharam performances. Uh, yeah. That's one thing. And the idea of so-called violence of it is supposed to be an expression of devotional love. I mean, that's how right. the idea is supposed to be. I mean, that's, and as you say correctly, I mean, especially in subcontinent, you have non-Shias who also participate. And, and, you know, we have evidence of that, you know, and in the case of Iran, it gets a bit different, but nevertheless, the, the logic is the same that you're, you're expressing devotional love uh, and allegiance, that's another as important aspect. But what's important is that, you know, with the, the so-called modern perspective in which comes to either condemn it or, or try to exoticize it or simply focus on that, you know, kind of ignores its own kind of self-violence uh, that is not necessarily so spectacle oriented, but it's very much happening in, in so many ways. One could argue that the Protestant work ethics is a some form of very uh, silent and invisible form of self-violence in which work consistently is put on the body as a way of having some kind of redemption uh, through, of course, through work. And that is not understood, especially in the Bavarian paradigm, to be any kind of self-violence. It's, it's somehow understood to be self-cultivation. You know, I think this is what we need to do. We need to shift our attention from um, the way we, we frame violence at something, you know, especially the way we exoticize it, uh, 
but as a way of disciplining, self-disciplining, as a way of, of creating selves. Now, one could come and reconstruct that quote-unquote self cultivation in saying the Maharam context of it, we could do that. That's absolutely fine. But once we come to impose a category of violence on Maharam self-mortification as quote unquote bad, but we do and not come to see the Protestant work ethics as some kind of form of self-violence, that's where we get into trouble. That's where we get the colonial categories coming to dominate our very everyday conceptions of life, which we completely ignore how violence is happening on everyday life without us even really realizing it. Yes. Uh, I mean, there is a global epidemic of depression. I mean, I, I'm sure exactly. a, lot of, a lot of it has to do with this, you know, everybody feels like they're losers, right? Uh, right? You got to work hard not to be a loser, yeah? Uh, just, just, so, to, just to introduce so, everyone, the, the secret yeah. world of doing nothing. It's a fascinating oh. critique of... Um, of, of that whole, the, the, the thing we just discussed. So, I mean, anyway, it's just so, one uh, it, But in this case, so what's interesting is that in this case, yeah, this self-punishing mm -hmm. is for the, uh, the, the reason for that is this narcissism, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's for narcissistic ends. It's for the glory of, the, of your own ego <laughs> in the world, yeah? Uh, that you punish yourself, yeah? Uh, whereas, of course, <laughs> you know, in, uh, however, internally, of course, it's a, as you pointed out, it cannot be uh, merely internal. There, there are there are somatic uh, yeah. uh, there there are somatic effects of it. Yeah, uh, but here, of course, this self-flagellation, uh, tatbir. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I mean, I you might know more. This is a question I might ask you. Uh, so what? Now, of course, tatbir is a hotly debated within Shia. Mm -hmm. Forget outside. Yeah, within Shiaism, Tatbir is pretty hotly debated question. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. What, I don't personally don't know. I uh, I wonder if you know uh, what the history of that. Uh, oh is. gosh, um, I, I think Professor uh, Nakash has written a fascinating article that he traces it to Anatolia, the origins of self mortification, and and he kind of discusses. And I've read this article many years ago, but but the idea of self violence, according to him, is something that could be traced to medieval Anatolia. Um, right. It's, no, no, but my yeah, question sorry, is more specific. My question is what I'm asking is, has there been such a debate on tatbir uh, within Shia? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it really started sometime, I mean, probably even predates, it goes to the 19th century, but I, I know for sure in 1950 it was a, a, a very uh, a much of a topic debate, you know. Um, but I modern. Mean, I'm sorry? But modern. Modern. It's a modern, modern debate. Oh, modern. It's, well, I mean, you mean talking about contemporary right now? I mean, well, I mean modern in the, in the sense of the 19th century being modern, 20th century being modern. The was there a debate on tatbir in the pre-modern period? Did there was That's a very good question. Honestly, I, I I don't know. I know the 20th century, but not 19th century. I don't know, so I I rather not say something. I, I wouldn't. I would be interested to know. Yes, um, yeah. that's something I'd like to find out. But yes. uh, even if it did exist, um, I, I I mean I I don't know. But my speculation is that it it would not have existed. Uh, but it, even if it did exist, it would have a very different parameters. Yeah. Uh, from what we have today, because the theme today, um, <coughs> precisely because of the geniality that you talk about, is uh, uh, functions in, in the popular imagination or the representation. Yeah, first of all, the uh, exoticization and objectification. The other really helpful part of your presentation, yeah, mm -hmm. this distinction between Arab and Ajam, mm. yeah, uh, oh, yeah, which is utterly prevalent. It, it's so important to the constitution of nationalisms, not just in Arab and Ajam, but also in a place like uh, India and South Asia. Yeah, that's right. That's where, right. where uh, you know, uh, all kinds of questions of uh, self-identity. Yeah. So in Pakistan, for instance, you know, Pakistan, of course, is a completely modern formation. The very, you know, it's mm. a the very idea came into existence in uh, well actually in exactly in 1933 but the whole question of where pakistan is located because pakistan seems to locate itself west of iran instead of <laughs> right uh, east of iran and a lot of that has to do with this idea in which you know all of this history literature culture was organized around 
uh, this distinction, this yeah. modern distinction, yeah. yeah, of Arab and Ajam, and which maps onto this uh, uh, modern distinction between Aryans and Semites. That's right. That's right. actually That's very, right. very, very popular distinction. You know, there's this famous. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, famous uh, uh, local scholar. His name was Dr. Israr Ahmed. And if you just do a Google search for Dr. Israr Ahmed and Aryans and Semites, oh, sorry, on YouTube, you'll find a little lecture by him. You won't be able to understand it because it's in Urdu. Uh, but this is what he says. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are Aryans and there are Semites. This is a Pakistani scholar, yeah, sitting in Pakistan. Yeah. And, you know, the Aryans, basically, he says the Aryans think and we act. Semites, the business of Semites, right? As, as, how are we Semites? Who knows? But, you know, right? Uh, in Pakistan, uh, but uh, uh, just by virtue of being Muslim. Yeah, so the racialization of Islam, yeah? Uh, the, the racialization of Islam is also closely tied into the whole thing that you're talking about. Major, major. And also racialization of other religions like Buddhism, which yes. was perceived to be Aryan religion. And, and even to this day, you know, the, 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 in popular culture, many believe that, you know, uh, it, it's, it's very, very pervasive. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, that's really wonderful. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, Ali Rad? No, no, uh, no questions yet on Facebook. I think uh, people must still be assimilating. Uh, you know, all the implications of this uh, fantastic talk that they've heard. Um, so, uh, unless you'd like to uh, say something else to conclude. No, I mean, I, I, fundamentally, I think uh, I, I wanted, I'm so happy I was able to say at least most of the things I wanted to say. I mean, um, obviously, with any kind of scholarly work, there's room for, you know, growth, improvement. There's always, you know, room for further discussion. Um, but um, ultimately, what I wanted to at least do here today was to kind of take a few categories and show the genealogy and kind of kind of separate them and, and let us see that, you know, there are different ways of looking at something like Maharam. But we could also look at other, you know, um, Islamic spiritualities. We could look at, for instance, uh, Hajj. We could look at, you know, different kinds of pilgrimage. We could look at different forms of being Muslim, um, you know, around the world through which these categories come to haunt us. Uh, the idea of good Muslim, bad Muslim continues to haunt us in so many ways. And the way Muslim spiritualities have been either condemned or praised uh, based on different, you know, um, uh, neo-colonial and, and new imperial um, uh, uh, ventures. Uh, the case of Iraq is a good example. Uh, I mean, I, I visited Iraq in 2005, I wanted to, have an interview with uh, Ayatollah Sistani, and this is the time when, you know, the Iraqi constitution is being being you know drafted, and of course Sistani is playing an interesting background role in, in, in drafting of the constitution. And um, while I was there, uh, and I was in you know traveling throughout mostly southern Iraq, uh, I really came across this idea that the 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 American venture in Iraq was trying to do was was the idea was to first and foremost somehow separate up the country at least you know not nominally but institutionally through different so-called sects you know the, the the courts as though they're a religious sect of their own and then the Sunni Arabs and then the, the Shias in the south that's something that really struck me uh, strange but that's something that's a distinct kind of a category <laughs> This idea of a nation building based on sex, which has been with, the, especially with the Brits since the 17th and 18th centuries, mostly 18th century onwards. But then there was also this aspect that how religion was perceived by the these these American officials, especially. Um, many of them actually did have a knowledge of, say, Sunni and Shia Islam, but fundamentally they came to the picture understanding um, Shiism based on uh, the conception of the cult of martyrdom. And this was also very famous in 1980s when, you know, the Lebanese Hezbollah was in so-called suicide terrorism. And, and many of these officials were reading these policy papers in the 80s, 70s and 80s, of course, the Iranian revolution in the background as well. And, and they were importing that in the way in which they saw Iraq should be shaped. Now, we could have a long discussion about what happened in Iraq, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, 
these categories are important. These categories that some many times come from scholarly works. They're very important in the way in which, you know, nations are being built, nations are being conquered, nations are actually uh, being communicated and dealt with, negotiated. I mean, how many times have you come across uh, a, a, an American official who would say, Iranians are not to be trusted, you know, in the nuclear deal. I mean, these are all racial categories in which are brought in into public discourse in the policy level. So I do want to make a connection here that when we are decolonizing Islamic spiritualities, we also need to de decolonize Islamic polities, <laughs> the way in which Muslims are, are understood in particular political ambiances. And through those ambiances, um, you know, those conceptions are institutionalized in, in, in trying to really uh, create and reshape the region or regions around the world. And Afghanistan is another great example now happening in the way, for instance, the Taliban has been described in contradiction to other Islamic groups. And, and again, we could talk about this uh, for a long time, but the point I'm trying to underline is that categories matter, concepts matter, and these are not innocent things or, or independent or separate um, ideas that are being debated among you know, armchair academics. These are actually uh, ideas that are not only important, but in fact, academics themselves are participating in, in, in these category formations. I cannot uh, tell you how many academics were participants to the Iraq conquest uh, of uh, the US invasion of Iraq on so many levels. And that's just one example. I mean, um, the case of 19th century is really the best example where imperial conquest was so tied uh, with production of knowledge and scholarly activities. Travel, of course, was very important, but also circulation of ideas as well. So, um, so that's what I want everyone, I, I invite everyone to look at those complicated histories, the way in which ideas are connected through travel, not just through conquest, but also through just innocent travel, including tourism. <laughs> How categories of that come to define, say, Muslim spiritualities come to uh, dominate ways in which Muslims are, are classified one way or another. Um, I think that would be the final point I would make. Excellent. Thank you. That uh, uh, Thank you for all of that. That's uh, really, really helpful and very, very important, all of it. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I uh, post quite a bit on uh, Facebook and I was just posting that it's not for nothing that it's not accidental that the, uh, uh, that the idea of Islam as a martial religion. This is just to add, just to give another example uh, to the kinds of uh, processes that you're talking about. The idea of Islam as a martial religion mm. yeah, flourished here in Pakistan, in South Asia, yeah, where the British after 1857 created the idea of the martial races. Oh. <laughs> yes? So, mm. You know, there's a very, very close. So, I mean, the, what you, you're absolutely right. So, it's not just from the West. Yeah. So, there is this because precisely because nationalism itself yeah. inherited these categories. That's right. Because That's nationalism absolutely. is obviously very much a modernizing thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a modernizing project. It's a modern project and a modernizing project. Nationalism itself deploys all of these categories that you're talking about. So, it's very much part of the um, uh, our self understanding now. That's right. It's, it's self-orientalizing. And in the case of Iran, too, you know, a, a, a segment of Iranian nationalism, a powerful one, picked up on Aryanism and continued to develop it all the way till even to the present time. There, there's still Iranian nationalists who argue that, you know, Iranians are Aryan race. And this is without even a hint of understanding of the ideological basis of that. And unfortunately, sometimes we even get scholars who use, for instance, Gobine in a very uncritical way to read, for instance, Ajar history in a very nationalistic sense, actually using Gobine, you know, to, and it just, it, it, it's troubling. And, and, and this is why it's so good to have spaces like this, you know, so we could have discussions and, and we could, you know, carry on critical discourse. Thank you, Professor Babak Rahimi. Uh, a real pleasure. Very, very edifying for us. Thank you so much. Khoda Hafiz. Khoda Hafiz. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. And inshallah, we'll see each other sometime in the future, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Bye.